podcasting from sunny Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome to Tips for Tour Operators, your podcast for growth hacks, marketing tips, and actionable insights from leading experts in the tourism industry. everybody. I'm Dustin Hoyman. I am the new host of the Tips for Tour Operators podcast. And today I'm really excited. We have one of my favorite people that I know in the tourism activity space, Matthew Newton, the founder of Tourism Tiger. Matthew is an absolute pro when it comes to all things uh, web related to tours and activities. He is the founder of Tourism Tiger. As I mentioned, they are a company that is specialized in creating uh, beautiful, high converting websites for tours. He has seen so many websites. He has seen so much data that he knows the ins and outs of what to do and what not to do on a website. So today we're talking a lot about mobile optimizations that you can make for your website, including just uh, how, to, how to look at your website in a different way and how to really uh, understand how people are looking at your website, absorbing your content and things you can do, small little tweaks that you can do that can have a huge impact on conversions on your website from converting from visitors to actual bookers. So check it out, let's get started. Welcome everybody to the Tips for Tour Operators podcast. We have Matt Newton from Tourism Tiger. Matt, how are you doing? I'm very well, Dustin. Thank you for having me on. Great. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. I really am excited. Um, you are somebody that everybody I talk to in the tour space, they know Tourism Tiger, they know you. Everybody says kind words and they just say, you're basically like, when it comes to websites, you are the expert. I hear that all over the place. <laughs> cool. Um, thanks, man. Um, that's 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 so flattering i guess to, to, to know that people are, are saying good stuff uh, it's a reflection not of just the work i've done but also the work that the entire team at um tourism tiger has done yeah that's really great so we talked a little bit before and we um are basically going to talk today about you know things that tour operators can do on their website to help you know increase bookings they got a lot of visitors and they want to increase those into actual bookings mm -hmm. so um you share with me a few tips and some of them are just really really incredible so yep. let's start with there. You know, what's the first tip people can do on their website? Cool. So um, just before I, I, I give my first tip, actually, I'm, I'm just going to explain one thing just for clarity. And that is, um, yes, I am the founder of Tourism Tiger and I've also joined Peak as well. I'm doing some work with Peak in terms of their marketing side. So um, I've, I've managed to generate one or two insights from that side of the house as well. So um, Peak Pro is obviously a booking software. Um, you probably talked to someone from Peak Pro in another date. So I'll... I'll I'll, um, I'm sure you'll enjoy that conversation, but, um, but having those two, those two perspectives has given me an even more rounded perspective than I had previously. So I think that that could give me some good perspective. So, so, um, today what I've done is pre prepared three major tips. And the first one is, um, stick the landing. And bef just before I dive into it, I just want to explain that, um, a lot of people look for some really advanced tips when it comes to websites or some tricks or whatever but so often they bypass the basic principles of the right thing to do. And, and the, one of the biggest reasons people do that is because you get so used to looking at your own website that you completely become disconnected as to how it appears to someone else. Right. So, um, yeah, that so that's why, yeah, the, the focus of the, of the, of the three tips are going to be around how can I put myself in, in someone else's shoes and in, in the user's shoes and in terms of how they perceive me. Right. Um, because okay. stick, the idea of stick the landing, obviously it comes from say, um, uh, gymnastics, right? Like someone runs up to a pommel horse or whatever and they jump in the air and they, they do all sorts of twists and then they stick that landing. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's such a, it's such a brief moment in time where so many things have to happen and have to go right in order for that gymnast to land correctly. And I feel like it's the same with, um, the true activity businesses, right? Like we, if you, if you run, say, a walking tour company or a bus tour company, you've done so much work in preparing your business. You've got all sorts of registrations. You've got all sorts of equipment. You've got guides. You've got logos. You've got all this sort of stuff. You've got marketing presence all over the place. You've done so much work to bring a visitor to your website for the first time. Um, no matter how they find you, the only way they found you is because of the, the product of a lot of effort that's gone in. And... Mm the worst thing that could possibly happen is obviously that the visitor gets the wrong impression from the first second and just clicks off. 
And, um, and so, so what I'm going to do is run through three things in that, in that category of, um, of how we can really help people. And it comes back to what I call the, the grandmother test. Um, sometimes I call it the, the drunk Italian grandpa test. And that's basically, <laughs> is it basically if, uh, and it comes back to when I built my very first website back in around 2004, 2005, something like that. I remember I, uh, I was, I was hanging out at my mum's place at the time, my parents' place. And I, and I was like, Hey mum, I want you to check out this cool website I've built. And she looks at it and she's just like, Hmm. So, uh, uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, sorry, can you explain this to me? And I'm like, Oh, no, it's just my mom doesn't get it. Yeah. It's a website about, it was actually about, um, limousines. And, um, and, and, and she's like, but where would I click? And I'm like, oh, you would click here. And then we went to the next page and I'm like, okay, so this page is really cool. And she's looking at it. She's like, oh, uh, sorry, I, I, Matt, can you explain this one to me as well? And I was really like, oh, silly mum, She doesn't understand the internet. And then we kind of went to the third page. She, she wasn't getting anything. And then I realized, hang on a second. It's not my mum's fault that she's not getting it. It's my fault that she's not getting it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, right. Um, so so if you think about it, um, it's not just about that drunk Italian grandpa, but can you imagine if you were to put your website in front of say, I don't know, your own parents or if they're still around your own grandparents or, or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and to see how they would react. Now, these are people who actually use your websites, right? Like one of the mm -hmm. highest spending tourism do demographics is what, like 55 to 64 year olds, right? Oh yeah. People mm -hmm. who are classically not particularly good at using um, websites, but it's not just that. If you think about it, um, if someone is distracted, they might display the same kind of behavior. You've got, uh, you know, um, if, if you think about a, a typical circumstance where someone's using the internet, it's pretty rare that someone closes, you know, gets into the, say, the study of their home, closes the door, turns off the lights in the house, tells everyone else, leave me alone for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to use the internet. That's not how internet mm -hmm. usage works, right? People yeah, use exactly. the internet. Um, I went on a tour in San Francisco re recently and I was chatting to this guy and he tells me, and I was like, so how did you find the tour? And he's like, well, I was having dinner at a restaurant and we just started looking at our options for the next day. So they were sitting there on their little phone using a restaurant Wi-Fi, right? Mm -hmm. so a couple mm -hmm. from Europe. And so they had to contend with they had the, the distraction of the noise, the distraction of their meals coming. They had the distraction of the, the slow Wi-Fi from the restaurant and they were battling mm -hmm. through all these things to get it done. So in that circumstance, you're not gonna exactly going to sit around for 15 seconds and wait for a website to load. You're going to focus on the, on the websites that seem the easiest and the most obvious straight up because you don't have, you don't really have the mental energy to waste your time giving it to operator the, the, the time of day. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah. that brings me to my first point is that it needs to be clear and every single it's, it's one of those things where unless you do that, that thing I just told you about of like putting it in front of someone who's not particularly internet savvy to help to get their understanding, you just will not understand how unclear your website is. Now I've built so many websites that I find it really, really easy to, um, to, to, uh, to figure it out straight away. But that's from 10 years of experience. The mm -hmm. first thing is the headline. Now, um, at peak, actually we just did an analysis of 52 operator websites and about half of them, just, just under half did not have a headline, which actually said what the company did on the website. Oh, wow. so, so, um, so effectively you'd have to figure it out from the logo and, of, and don't, don't forget mm -hmm. on mobile phones where the majority of Twitter activity operator of uh, bookings happen, the logo is too small to read, right? Oh, um, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you have, you know, sometimes you can figure it out from the photos, but sometimes you can't and, and often the headline is literally welcome or, you know, some sort of thing, which is which is not descriptive, right? So the first thing is just to have the, don't try to be clever. Just try to mm -hmm. just be straight down the middle as we say in Australian uh, sports and, and just, and just make it extremely clear. This is what we do, right? Las mm -hmm. Vegas, Jeep rentals like that. Right. <laughs> and then, and then you push for your second thing, which is um, credibility. So that's the second point. So the first one is clarity. There's three C's actually to this one. The first one's clarity. The second one is uh, credibility. So okay. um, credibility comes th through the explicit information you put on your homepage and the rest of your website, but it also comes through the other things that come through as well. So um, just to give you such a clear example, about two weeks ago, I was looking at renting a kayak. I was on holiday near Sydney and I was looking at renting a kayak and I was looking at two different websites. One of them had a brand new website and one of them had an old website. Now it's funny, right? Like 
the age of the website has nothing to do with the age of the kayaks. But both my wife and myself, despite knowing this explicitly, we were like, let's go with that one because I, would, I reckon their equipment's probably better. So you looked at the website and one website looked old and dated and one yeah. website looked new and your right. brain made the connection that the new website must have newer kayaks. Exactly, right? It oh, must wow. be a new business yeah. with new kayaks. And even though a lot of people wouldn't do this explicitly, implicitly or like, um, yeah, in their subconscious, this is what they're feeling, right? If they see an old website, they're expecting to get onto an old minibus. If they see a, a new website that's slash, you know, flash and slick, they're expecting the bus to be flash and slick. They expect like, mm. and, and don't forget, and what I always talk about this, about when I talk about this, this, um, this idea is that um, the website is a lens, right? So if you think about it, like the way a camera lens works or like an eye lens works, you have like the image, right? Or the, the light that's coming through. And then you have the receptacle where the light passes through. Mm -hmm. And then you have, um, so where the light's coming from, then we have it passes through. And then you have the receptor, right? So the business, right? You have your entire business mm -hmm. passing through this tiny lens, which is one little screen of a website. Mm -hmm. and gets oh, yeah. the receptor. So you have information loss at both stages, right? For, at, into the website and then from the website into the person. So, um, so effectively um, that credibility needs to screen through in a great logo, great web website design uh, uh, that works. Um, it needs to be obviously relatively modern. If you have a relatively cheap web design, there's a good chance that other people will be able to pick up on that as well because the cheap web design is, um, they do their best job, but you know, there's only so many hours in a day that you can get to it. Right. And then you've got, um, uh, and then you've got all those other aspects as well, such as putting, um, just mentioning the fact that you've been in business for eight years or mentioning the fact that you've had mm. eight, over 8,000 customers. You might mention, you might mention both of those things like 8,000 visitors, um, uh, since 2008 or whatever, right? Um, it's, it's, it's really important to build both of those things into, into your business um, explicitly through, through, uh, through awards and through the actual text of um, talking about this sort of stuff and then through the design and quality of your imagery, which I'll talk about in a second as well. Now, the mm -hmm. third thing, which is really, really important, and I learned this actually, I, I used, before I started Tourism Tiger, I worked at a tour and activity um, marketing agency. It wasn't just tour and activities, but they, they one of, that was one of their big core areas, kind of like what your current um, agency is, Dustin. And um, mm -hmm. and basically what happened was it, that I had the opportunity to help about 80 companies at any one time with SEO, right? Which is, as you manage, pretty stressful because I had to manage literally 80 different marketing campaigns at any one time. Mm -hmm. But um, but at the same time, I was able to learn really, really quickly. It was like being going inside the matrix. It was, it was, I was able to learn really quickly what works because I had access to Google Analytics to see exactly which websites were performing well and which ones weren't. And one thing I noticed was that the websites where you have a really clear option to click somewhere were the ones that were generally doing better. So typically, with especially with more stale web designs, you'll see that um, there's a bit of a website, there's a bit of a menu at the top you got to scroll down a bit, but there's no real clear path that it's guiding me on. Whereas if you look at say a modern tour and activity website, they'll have, um, let's just say they have three options. They just have the three options. You know, they have the headline and the image and the three options like are kind of like right there. Either that or there's a button that kind of guides me to my next step. You should always mm -hmm. have something really clear that you're guiding everyone to click on. So with Tourism Tiger, for example, um, one time we played with it, we actually did a test on a, on a few different websites. We had some websites that they had the hero area, which is that area with the headline and the image and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the menu up the top, but no, we had to scroll down to find the place to click. And then what we did was we added either one button or two buttons, depending what was appropriate to, to the, the middle of the hero area. And the amount of people that were clicked on that button was ridiculous. So we use something known as a heat map. Are you, um, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but there's a tool called, um, <laughs> hot, there's a tool called a uh, hot jar, where basically you can actually see where people are hovering and clicking on your website. And it went from people kind of being scattered all over the place to being, it was like, it was like the surface of the sun kind of thing, right? Everyone yeah. clicking on that exact button because you're guiding them. So three principles, be clear, be credible and be click friendly. So we have clear, credible, click friendly. And, and how does somebody, you know, they're looking at their website. They've had a tour for, let's say you use eight years as an example, you know, they're, they're successful so far, you know, they're making bookings, but, when they look at their site, they've seen it for, let's say they've seen it for eight years. Mm -hmm. At that point, it's, it's ancient in web years. How does right. someone actually take a step back and remove themselves? You had mentioned you, the, the 
drunk Italian grandfather test. But, um, you know, besides that, how does someone take a step back and remove themselves from the site that, that they think is really effective? You know, what's a, what's a tool that they can do for that? Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned actually that they think is really effective because sometimes people are like, oh yeah, my website gets bookings, therefore it's working, right? But mm-hmm. um, at the same time, like if I have a, if I have, uh, if I'm in a Formula One race, right, and my car is is working, but it's going half the speed that it could, it's clearly not actually working. It's doing half the job, not doing the full job, (laughs) right? Exactly. You're not going to win that race. So um, in terms of, obviously, if someone's website is eight eight years old, it probably means it's not mobile friendly. So you probably would have to um, Mm -hmm. get updating it. But um, regardless, as a general principle, um, you can start with people in your office, obviously, who would be somewhat familiar with your website. Mm -hmm. But, um, but but friends, and the thing is, the thing is, it sounds so simple and it feels like a bit of a drag and this is part of the reason no one ever does it, but it's just a, such a simple principle of just show it to someone who's never been on it, who you know is honest, right? Now, and, <laughs> that's, um, so, that's a good point. And, and, uh, and um, potentially, uh, you know, who doesn't know what you do? Um, the, the thing is, it is potentially, obviously, if you've been in business for eight years, kind of, it may be difficult to find that, that, that person who you know well, who's able to be honest, who, et cetera. But at the same time, mm-hmm. it's, it's a, it, I think if you start showing it to other people, instantly your mentality changes. You start viewing it through their eyes for the first time. Are there any questions that somebody could ask you know, to really dig into that? And, you know, and mm-hmm. if people start showing their friends, you know, oftentimes you hear uh, you know, a little bit of feedback, but they're afraid to hurt your feelings. And, mm-hmm. But there any, are there any questions that you've seen that are just really effective in, in pulling some of that information out? Yeah, for sure. That's a, that's a really great question, Dustin. So the first one would be, um, without knowing anything else, what do you think this business does? Right? Okay. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so just, just by looking at this screen, like, what do you think this, this business does? And, um, and secondly, it could be... Uh, just by looking at this screen, what is the impression you have on this business? Now, one thing about asking good questions is that you have to, like a question to like the one I just asked, you have to be really, um, you have to listen to not just the words, but also the silence. So what are they not saying? Right. So you okay. should probably have, when you ask a kind of question like that, have a list of, okay, here's the things I want people to say, right. Then you put it mm-hmm. in front of them and they're, and they're saying, Oh, it looks like a kayaking business. Right. Okay. Good. But they're saying, Oh man, that looks like a lot of fun. Or are they not, right? Like I've shown websites to people where you put it in front of them. Uh, we had this company in Mexico that did that um, thing. Uh, it, well, it was a fun activity. I, I don't know how to describe it. But um, <laughs> in one photo, it looks but like we had difficulty describing it. That's why we just took a photo of it and just put it like smack bang in the center of the homepage just, just to skip the explanations, right? And then the headline made sense. And so um, and I, I, turned it, I turned my screen and showed a guy and like his first reaction was, I want to do that. Oh right. yeah. 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 He wasn't like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like, you know what I mean? The way people are when they're trying to find a good piece of feedback to give, he was just like straight away, I want to do that. And that was, um, and that was when we knew that we'd gotten that design right. Oh yeah. That's incredibly telling. You know, I never would have yeah. thought about that. You know, seeing if somebody goes, yeah, okay. Like this is a kayaking company. Uh-huh. Uh, there's, there's a company, um, I'm going to plug a random tour that I just stumbled upon about a year ago called uh, Sequest in San Diego, right. where it's like a, almost like a submarine that looks like a shark. And the first time I saw that, uh, they had a video on their page and I saw that and I was like, I just want to, I, I didn't know anything about it. I'm like, I want to do that. That looks awesome. Basically you uh-huh. just drive a shark vehicle submarine around the, the oceans and it seems incredible. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And that's when having, that's where having a great value proposition really helps. Um, and the third question could be like, um, all right, where would you click? right? Um, it comes back to the three C's in a way, the, the questions mm-hmm. I'm giving here. Like, where would you click just so to help, so to, to, see, to see how they would navigate? Um, don't forget people are distracted. They've got the kids tugging at their pants. Um, you know, think about families going on holiday. The last thing, mm-hmm. you know, like they, tend, tend to, they tend to just go straight to the jugular in terms of the website use. So it's interesting to watch where people would actually click. Um, that, that could be like a set of questions, but I think another good exercise as well is, is um, to do that, but also to do something else with some other people and basically like sit people down and say, I'm just about to show you a website. Now you're coming to San Diego, hypothetically, you're coming to San Diego mm-hmm. in two days. It's just you and your wife and you're looking for something to do. Uh, you're available. You're looking, you're looking for something to do on, on Saturday and your budget is 
$150, more or less maximum that you're looking to spend, but you're happy to go to $200 for something special, right? And just okay. turn the website around and say, go, right? So okay. Like, hey, I'm coming to San Diego and you obviously try to match the circumstances as much as possible to the actual circumstance so they don't have to yeah. remember the hypotheticals. And, um, and then you can see like, okay, all right, I'm looking for San Diego. I'm coming in two days. So what are the questions on my mind? The questions are availability. Right. This is why obviously um, bookie software has taken off so much is, is because that availability question is so important. You're, another question you have is press. Um, mm -hmm. Another question you have is what is it and what is it like? But, um, but also you have this, um, this overarching thing um, as well, which is I've got to find something. And this is just one of many options that are, that I'm currently trying to get through to find the, the best result. Right. And this is why mm -hmm. so many people, um, so many people bounce so quickly is because you're just a list of 10 for them and they're, they're hunting for the gold. Right. So I, uh, actually recently, well, two years ago, actually I got married and I went on a honeymoon and I went to Greece and it was interesting. Even a lot of the companies that had booking software, I found their websites really frustrating because of how many clicks it took me to get to the booking software. Mm -hmm. So, because, because I had those questions on my mind, I was like, what is it? How much is it? Cause my budget was for a particular experience. My budget was around a hundred, 120 euros each. And, um, I was looking for one or two certain days and I was looking and then, um, I was getting educated by the different websites as I went through. I was like, all right, mm -hmm. so I'm definitely going to want one that has a barbecue and I definitely want to want to want to have one that stops to have a snorkeling time or something like that. Right. It was like mm -hmm. an onboard experience. And so the thing is, was that like, yeah, it, there was like 15 of these companies. So I was just like flicking through as quickly as I could to make a short list. And then I kind of narrowed down and okay. that's, uh, and that's, and that comes and, and that's why those principles that I just mentioned work so well is because it helps you get through that initial filter of the short list. Now it helps if you come from trip, if they've come from TripAdvisor and they've just read six amazing reviews about you and they've already picked you. Um, but, and that's, and that will give people the motivation to get through a bad website. Um, but if people don't have that motivation, obviously, and you have a lot of competition, you don't just fall off. Mm -hmm. So sticking on that clarity thing, because I think it's really incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So you talked about, you know, making sure that it's really clear and people are excited. What other information could be, and you touched on a little bit, you know, pricing. Is, it, is mm -hmm. pricing something that's part of the clarity? You know, what are some of those right. items that are part of what I'm going to call clarity? Right. So I'll talk a bit about the homepage because actually um, I've, my third point in terms of my three categories mm -hmm. goes in, uh, into a lot more detail about, okay. uh, about that. Um, but in terms of the homepage, yeah, the clarity, just the explicitness of the headline, basically what is it? Uh, why? Like just a bit of your why. So you that credibility okay. aspect and what do you want me to do next? Um, form um, part of the clarity. The goal of the, obviously of the homepage isn't to get people to hang around. Now we tend to, at terms of like we tended to build longer homepages because if someone's hanging around on the homepage and they've, all, and they've seen all those click options and they still want to scroll down, we want to give them, we want to help them sort of bathe themselves a little bit in the experience. But obviously a homepage is succeeding is the one that where people are actually not hanging around on that homepage. It's the one where people <laughs> see it, decide to hang around and go in. Right. So you want someone to take action right away. Yeah. I don't want someone to like dilly dally on that thing. I want them to, I want to give them extremely clear options and have them head into the next part of the process. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a good point. So what's your next tip? Great. So the next tip is around the visual. So we can come up with all sorts of hacks all day long, but if your photos and your videos aren't great, um, then you're going to have trouble. Um, and, Coming back to that um, software tool Hotjar that I mentioned where you can actually see where people are clicking yes. on the website or where they're hovering on the website. That was actually really fascinating to see how people reacted to um, our web designs. And we, we noticed that every single time you put a gallery on a tour and activity page, and we did it every single time, obviously, um, people, that was it, all the heat went to the gallery. People always focus on opening the images. And that was really fascinating. And I, I thought some people would open the images, but I wasn't expecting to see that such a high percentage to the point where basically nothing on the, uh, like in comparison, nothing on the page was getting attention almost because people were so focused on the imagery and you're just like, yeah, exactly. It comes back to that principle I just talked about. Like here's the actual experience. Here's the website. Here's me. 
And so what people are trying to do is live the experience for a little while through the video or through the photo to get the experience of what it's like. The written stuff, it matters, but if you don't have the visual aspect, it won't, it won't help you at all. And ironically, one of the categories of businesses that does this really poorly is actually photography tours. I've never actually understood oh, wow. this photography tour. I've actually never seen a good photography tour website. Um, wow, they always, like yeah, they're photo really yeah. Yeah. yeah, like they often have really good photos and they're like that big. They oh, well, if you're listening, they're you know two inches big or one inch big. They're tiny photos, <laughs> and you can't expand them. And you know the website's ugly, and you're just like, man, don't you get it? <laughs> Um, I've never understood that one, but, um, but overall, not uh, overall giving, giving people that high quality imagery is, is really important. One time we told a customer about this and they just went out and took photos on their iPhone. And honestly, the photos were really not that good. And we we're like, sorry, you're going to have to pay someone to do this. And they were like, oh, but that's a lot of money and that sort of stuff. And they ended up finding a student on Craigslist. So, um, if, so if you don't have the budget, there are multiple ways. Like, um, I have an iPhone 10. I could, I can take good video and good photos in that, but mostly because I know what I'm doing. So yeah. you, you could, um, I mean, if you run a 20 video operated company, you probably have a lot of staff that are, uh, uh, you know, internet savvy or Instagram savvy and, and just because they have been effectively trained on how to take good photos just by virtue of they're constantly trying to get likes on Instagram. If that makes sense. Oh, so, yeah, um, sure. so you could, that could be like a first step. If you have absolutely no budget at all, just get someone on your team to go out and do it. Um, get out, get out, um, someone on your team to do it, get them to take some photos, get, get them to potentially take some video, which they basically edit into really snappy, short one minute, video and mm. and and you can get some really good results if you just follow some um, basic principles uh, one thing i've learned actually from trying to teach people is that those basic principles actually are very hard to teach like it's one thing to know this <laughs> stuff in your head and the other thing is yeah. like okay you need to follow these three rules right and they come back and they're like i followed the three rules and then um then you realize there's actually eight other rules that you didn't realize were rules until you saw the mistakes happening and then i had to be like no well you actually had these other eight things and then with this client that I'm actually talking about, we ended up with something like 18 different rules that they had to follow to make a good video. <laughs> and, and maybe, and then after four attempts, they just gave up right? because they just, the moral just, of the story is really, you know, find yeah. either a professional or yeah. like work your way into someone who knows how to take good photos. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> like unless, unless you are regularly complimented on the quality of your photos, you don't take good photos, right? It's one of those things where you've got to listen to the silence. If you're not, if it doesn't matter what you think, if people regularly compliment you, you can go, you can go for it. And I'm talking about by people as in like people whose opinion matter, right? Like if my mom compliments me all the time on my photos, right? Her opinion on my photos doesn't matter. Right. But my wife is very picky about photos. If she compliments my photos, I'm like, yes, I did a good one. So, so go to somebody who's very honest and not afraid to hurt your feelings. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah, and make sure that great imagery in those great videos. Um, just before we, we uh, move on from that topic, if you think about the investment, so sometimes people focus on the cost, but clearly it's an investment, right? Because you can use those photos in so many places. You can use them on your website. You can use them on your next website. You can use them on your brochures. You can use them on your, uh, your Yelp listing. You, you, you can upload them to TripAdvisor. There's so many ways to use it. And you can generally get, you know, a good five or six years out of images. And, and if, if you're only spending one, one and a half thousand dollars, you, you really don't think that the investment's going to pay itself back really quickly and mm -hmm. not just that pay itself back a hundred times over. Yeah. I mean, just to talk on that, everything that I've seen from, you know, we, we are a very data heavy company, those images and galleries, they, they do, they drive everything. I mean, they're going to turn your business. I mean, it, for some things, you know, they can turn your business around if you're getting a lot of traffic and, and you just have terrible imagery. Like you said before with the kayaks, if, if you can't take the time and put the right investment into taking quality photos, maybe you're not going to take the time and investment to make sure that the, the equipment is up to date and properly maintained. You know, there's that stream of, you know, carrying your brand through into the experience. Yeah, exactly. And that just comes back to the whole branding thing that has, has started to run through pretty much every point that I've made is that, is that, it's not just about what people explicitly think. It's about what they think subconsciously. Yeah, exactly. So I want to, uh, before we move on, I want to talk on one thing is you had mentioned you've seen photography tour galleries that were, were awful. So mm -hmm. can you just touch on a couple points of what makes a good gallery? 
Yeah. So the, the main issue that I had with the photography tool websites that I saw was firstly, often the websites are, are not that particularly well designed as in, you know, they're quite dated or old or whatever. The second thing is just the size of the images. So they often, they have these, what could be great images, but that are tiny. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually I'm going to, I'll, I'll probably dive into a little bit more. So if you, if you want to make a great photos to your website, there's a, just a few, there's three basic rules of the types of photos you need. And this reflects back on what I see on photography tours. They put photos, they put amazing photos up, like the kind of photos you might take, but that's all they put, right? But you need three things. Firstly, you need photos um, showing the experience um, when you do a tour and activity. So, um, you know, you might show someone on a kayak or you might show the kayak. Um, so you need to show the, the experience and, and someone enjoying the experience. The second thing is you need to show it from the point of view of the person. So not just show people enjoying the experience, but what am I going to see with my eyes? Right. Mm, so okay. um, I'm going to have, so like rafting companies, for example, it's different companies make different mistakes, right? So like a day tool company will make the mistake of only showing people the photos of what they're going to see. A rafting tool company will only put photos of people in rafts, right? But you need both <laughs> mm -hmm. things. Like if, if I'm showing you photos of a, of a rafting experience, I need to show like when people are sitting in the raft, what are they going to say? Right. Cause oh, you, yes. you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Right. Like I'm going to have the water, I'm going to have the water crashing in over the boat and I'm going to feel that action. That, that kind of third party shot from the, the riverbanks is nice, but it does, doesn't quite hit those emotional sort of touch points that you might want to do. The third thing is, sh is showing the business itself, providing the experience, right? Does that okay, make sense? On that a little bit. Yeah. So for example, rafting companies is really easy because you have the guide in the raft with the people, but other, mm -hmm. other ones, for example, on a day tour company, if you just show photos of the place you're going to visit, that's okay. That's why people are going to your city, but it's not why people are picking you right? You need to oh, show mm -hmm. you delivering that experience, if that makes sense. Right. So you just, oh, yeah, so sense. it could, so it could be like for a photography tour, it would be a photo of them actually, you know, with their camera out and with the camera, someone next to like with the, the camera, like of a guest right next to them. And they're kind of like walking, you know, showing them something on, on, on the, on their view thing on their screen, whatever it's called. <laughs> um, and, and, and like, cause that experience of a photography tour is obviously I'm getting guided by this person how to take better photos. So what you'd be doing is having photos of that exact emotional experience. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That um, makes a lot of sense. Cause that can also be a huge differentiator. If there's a lot of competition in your market, mm -hmm. that guide is often the person that everyone finds falls in love with and, and they are going to remember the guide as much as they remember the experience. Exactly. And that's, that's always the way it works out in practice. And it's funny how people forget that when they, when they're talking about their website is that, um, you can't lean too heavily too much on that because it does take the face to face meetings to really fall in love with someone. But at least mm -hmm. you can show that I'm doing that human aspect, especially if that's part of your value proposition. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So we have, we need to have galleries, good quality images, show pictures of the experience, sort of pictures of the point of view in the experience and then the business as well. You know, how they're going to interact with the business. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's incredibly helpful. Yeah, man. Cool. So which leads me to my, my last big tip, which is to have a, and this comes back to that clarity aspect I told you about, but it's to put a mm -hmm. snack pack of information on your tour and activity page. So this comes right back to all the data, um, that we've taken out of websites just from having built so many over time and actually um, having switched to peak as well and working, uh, working now and, and seeing it from the other side, it's like, absolutely. Yes. The, the, these principles totally matter and it's great to have that confirmation. So the idea of a snack pack is if you think about it, I'm looking at a tour and activity page, you've successfully taken me from the home page to that page. And then you give me a wall of text, a huge description of the tour right? Like you wouldn't read that. Why would you expect <laughs> me to read that? Like yeah. it's, a, it's a, the lack of empathy with the guests and we see it all the time. It's even on, on modern attractive websites, once you get to actual experience, it's like text, right? And it may be broken up into sub headlines and maybe even aesthetically attractive, but it's written in such a way that you haven't sold me then why I need to read the text. So mm -hmm. effectively what need, we need to do is help people answer those initial questions first. So what the, what is the experience like? We can answer that with the gallery, which is right prominently at the top. We have the clarity of the headline, obviously, but then we have additional information. We have the price and 
we have what's included is a really common one that we see people, the price is the number one thing that people focus on after the gallery in pretty much 100% of cases. And then mm -hmm. it starts to vary, but typically what people focus on is uh, what's included. Um, the starting point, because don't forget, like you have multiple people visiting your website. Some of them, um, some of them at the starting point actually really matters to them because some people are looking for something that's close to where they're staying. Um, other people who visit your website are people who've already booked a tour and they're trying to, trying to go back and figure out more details about it. And we have to serve that market too, because it actually saves you a lot of time in terms of customer service questions. So, so what's my starting point? Um, what's not included? all that kind of stuff, right? So this basically, you know, a very simple summary of using bullet points. It has to be bullet points. Um, it's just explaining like just the very basic things I need to know to know that I'm actually interested in this one, right? Mm -hmm. Cause like I said, with the Greece thing, I was, I was like, after at least looking at two companies, I was like, okay, I'm only going to go on one that has an onboard barbecue. Cause I think that sounds amazing. So I shortened it down to three companies that had onboard barbecues and then I picked up from one of them. Right now, if yeah. it's buried in the text, you're making me do a lot of work to figure out where it is, um, to figure out if you had a barbecue and there's probably a company out there that could have had the pleasure of having me for a day on their boat. Um, but they didn't because of, of just, just because of that, who knows? Um, and so basically you sell me on, on that sort of stuff. This is the sort of things that everyone's going to read that everyone's going to check. And then there are a lot of people who do want to read more information, but that's not everyone. And you need to sell people on wanting to read that extra information. So yes, after that is when you can put the detailed descriptions with the sub headlines and going in much more detail to the experience. That is also key. Um, but it is not, should not be to the exclusion of the snack pack. And also interestingly, mm -hmm. there's people who come to me and they're like, well, my, I don't want to put much text in my website because I don't read the text. I'm like, great. You're the person who reads the snack pack, right? You're going to yeah. get the snack pack, right? <laughs> and then there are other people who love doing the reading thing. Um, uh, just a random fact, Japanese uh, website visitors are notorious for reading every single word on a page before booking, right? Hmm, interesting. So um, uh, different cultures actually have different ways of interacting with a page. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, you, you need to give that snack pack, which everyone will read and then have the longer information, make sure it's all structured and very easy to consume. And that mm -hmm. will make it a lot easier for people to pick your tour or shortlist your tour, or at least save your staff um, a lot of questions. And um, wrapping up those three tips that I've just shared by putting those, by implementing these, and obviously those are three really core principles, but there's other ones too. Um, by implementing these, with tourism, so I get that what we were always trying to do was increase people's sales. And typically mm. that's what we saw. I mean, in the, since I started it three or four years ago, typically, you know, if, if, if someone tells you the sales went up by 20%, that's a bad result, right? Like it's like, okay, 20%, mm. I guess that's okay. But typically we've been seeing 20, 30, 40, 50. There's been three instances where people's business has grown by more than a hundred percent the year, oh, wow. right year as a result. Um, and quite, and actually quite a few instances of 40 to 80%. Now, obviously, they might be spending more on marketing in other, in other guises, so we can't claim the full credit, but, but I've seen it work. And, it's, and, and increased sales is great. That was my goal. But my goal was not to reduce the amount of annoying questions that were coming through the website. I just, I just didn't even consider that as a, as a factor. But one of the most common pieces of feedback to I get is like, oh, wow, like I'm just getting way less annoying phone calls from people asking me questions that are that – that um, I thought the website was answering, if that makes sense. Right? Is that because you implement those snack packs and you know, they're, when they're searching for stuff. the answer they're looking for, they can skim it a little bit easier? Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. I remember what, like, I was talking to one guy who was thinking about signing after Tourism Tiger two years ago, and he told me, and he's like, oh man, people are so silly. I get all these calls asking for the price and it's right there on the website. And then when I looked at his website, clearly it was all the way down at the bottom. It was literally the very last thing. Oh, wow. Right. And, and <laughs> of a lot of information too. And I was a bit like, mate, the reason <laughs> is because people don't want to scroll all the way down and they don't expect to find the price there. And, um, and, it, it, it's so often we think, oh, silly people, lazy people, they're calling me, they got these stupid questions. No, like think about, come back to my mother, right? Was it her fault that she was un unable to understand my website or was it my fault, right? So yeah, that's such a good point. Every yeah. question, every phone call you get, it is your fault, right? That they weren't able to figure out the, figure out the information they needed from the information you provided and that they weren't able to see an easy pathway to get there. Now you won't be able to fix all of it, but you can mm -hmm. eliminate 80% of it. And um, 
for me, that's a pretty big win. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So one of the things I want to ask you, and you touched on it a little bit when you were saying you were in San Francisco looking for a tour, is when you were thinking about it, you were on your phone. Mm-hmm. You know, what is the importance of that, that mobile friendliness these days? It's funny how important it is and how little importance people attach to it. It's a part of the, I think part of the issue is that when people, when tour operators sit down and think about their own website, they're like what you and me are right now. We're on desktop computers. So when people mm-hmm. think about the website, they think about it as a desktop experience. And I forget that for most people, it's not, it's a, it's a mobile experience. So you should, so you should generally, the, 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 a good way to flip your mentality here is just to try and only use your website exclusively on your phone. Right. Cause that's, oh, the way, yeah. that's the way the majority of people do use it. And I think you'll find a higher percentage of people who are actively looking at buying will use you on mobile too, mm-hmm. even though maybe the majority of your bookings don't come on mobile. So an interesting factor that we see, um, and this is across the industry and these statistics are definitely, you know, I've seen, I've seen it with, you know, within peak systems now that I have access to a lot of numbers. Um, sometimes you'll see that people have a majority of their bookings on desktop, but I, I'll know for a fact, having built, their website that um, the the majority of their visitors on on mobile, and so people it kind of that kind of is one thing that causes people to discount the the importance of mobile. Um, the the thing is obviously you know, firstly yes clearly it's important. Secondly, mm-hmm. just because someone doesn't book on mobile doesn't doesn't mean they haven't transferred to desktop later. So often when people will do the initial um, shortlisting on mobile and then they'll switch to desktop to do their final bookings. I know that I, that's typically the way I book travel. Actually, I do nearly all my research on my mobile and do nearly all my final bookings on my desktop just because I expect the experience of booking on mobile to be so bad right now. Obviously, <laughs> obviously, you know, some companies um, do it fantastically um, and I wouldn't say just peak, but like peak is one of them. And there's many, many others as well, but there's other, other companies that don't, right. Um, especially yeah, websites yeah. where they've built their own little cookie cutter system and it works terribly on mobile. You're just like, Oh, I don't want to go through that. But that doesn't mean we should discount the mobile experience because the mobile experience is where, I, where so many people do that, that, that basic, um, short listing of, um, of the, uh, of what their activity is going to be in the next couple of days. And you can't, you can't discount that one factor. I just wanted to add it as well. Is, is with mobile is not just the user friendliness is mm-hmm. the speed aspect, right? Because oh, yes. Very important. I find that when people, people talk about speed almost exclusively about SEO, but for me, that's just like you, the website visitor experience is much more important than Google's experience. Cause you know, speed with Google is just one of you know hundreds of factors in their, in their algorithm. Mm-hmm. But me as a website visitor, it's a real factor in how I use the website. So focus on user first and think about it. I'm in a hotel. I'm on crappy Wi-Fi. Why are you making me work to get your website downloaded? And that's, and that's where you can have a bit of a contradiction between my gallery tip and my speed tip. But um, if you, you can build your website cleverly in such a way that you only have say one big photo and then you have little thumbnails where people can click it and then it loads the photo. That's what we do at Tourism Tiger and it works really well. Um, but yeah, factor in, the f- just remember every single thing that I've, I've, I've talked about and just in terms of that lens and just think about, it's just so much more difficult on mobile for people to understand your website, for them to get it to work, for them to get it to load, to, to have that beautiful, clean experience is going to help you so much. Sure. Yeah. We had uh, Douglas Quinby, uh, co-founder of Arrival. He was on an earlier podcast mm-hmm. and he talked about a huge number of people actually don't book or even start researching some of the tours and activities until they're in destination. Oh and yeah. Anytime you go traveling, you probably do have your laptop in a bag somewhere back at the mm-hmm. hotel. Mm-hmm. You definitely have your phone with you and you're out and about and you're doing right. all your right then and there. Right. And people are expecting it more and more. And, um, uh, I remember actually doing a bit of research into this before I joined peak. And when I was at tourism tiger, I spoke to multiple booking software companies and they all told me, Oh yeah, the amount of bookings happening in the last 48 hours is going up continuously. That is because the consumer is basically having an expectation that I'm going to be able to find something using my mobile. I don't need to plan anymore. I'm just going to wait till, um, you know, I might be living in New York and I might be driving up to upstate New York. Right. A lot of people in that exact circumstance will be doing the research while like the husband's driving and the wife is in the, in the front seat or some sort of circumstance like that. And, um, and, and they'll be doing the research in the front seat and having a conversation with everyone in the car. Wow. And, um, that's just one example, but it's, it's becoming more and more common nowadays. Yeah, I know for me, I mean, I, everything I do is on my phone. Like you said, you do all your research there and then, and then when you get home and you settle and you're, you got your credit card out, then it might go. So that's a really important tip. Yeah. 
And actually one, one additional point as well is that often when people are having this conversation, they think in terms of say international visitors or people who are traveling to the area. Um, the other day I was trying to book an experience and I actually, I think the reason I keep on using my own examples is because every time I try to book a tour and activity experience, I'm so honed in what my experience is like because I realized that even though it was just me once, there's hundreds of other thousands of people around the world going through the exact thing right now. Mm. And, um, and basically, you know how it happens. Sometimes you, you have a plan fall through on a Saturday morning or you just don't have anything to do. You haven't thought that far ahead. And you're a Saturday morning and you're like, I want something to do today. And, mm-hmm. and, I, and I went through multiple tour and activity companies and they had it set up so I can't book 24 hours in advance. And so what was interesting though was that the software didn't show that there was any potential availability. They would just show that days mm-hmm. grayed out, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so what it wasn't like, oh, you know, tours running today, click the call or whatever. It was just like gray, right? Yeah. So um, I saw, that's what I saw with one. There was another company where you ha- like physically, you know, you have to book all tickets 24 hours in advance. Otherwise you have to come to the place and all this sort of stuff. And like people, it was just a pain, right? It was such a pain to, uh, and in the end I booked nothing. Right. I was looking at three different oh, things. Wow. I was looking at like a wildlife park. I was looking at a zip line and I was looking at um, like a tour, like a big sort of monster truck kind of going up a hill tour. <laughs> Very random. <laughs> and um, I, didn't, I didn't book any of the three simply because all three of them had such a terrible experience with um, online availability on the same day. So I would say to people, I would really encourage you try to think about the people who are trying to book on the same day, the people whose plans just fell through the people who just not very good at planning it at, at, at all. And so they're waiting, they waited until the very, the very day, the very same day to actually, you know, start doing their research. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to point any, any fingers besides that me, obviously. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but um, we need to factor all of these experiences in and it's by, it's by doing that, by taking into account the different visitor experiences and every single angle that people take it and be able to cater to every single one. That's when you get that cumulative gain in, uh, mm-hmm. in sales. So that leads me to ask a really important question. And this is um, going to lean on your peak side a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, with the advent of online booking and they, they, and like peak is really good. You know, a lot of these, these online booking softwares are just becoming, you know, a lot easier to use and a lot more just available to tour operators. Uh, and I've seen a big push to, to everybody trying to book online but how do you feel about still, you know, having available contact forms, phone numbers, you know, how important is that? Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I was having a bit of a debate the other day with a web design company about this. And um, because in some cases, there's companies that don't want to have online booking. In some cases that it's actually better for them to have a form. Uh, for example, custom custom tool companies that do you know, mm-hmm. eight to $10,000 packages um, for them to have online booking is just silly, right? You know, they need oh, to yeah. drive people to, to a lead, a lead form. Um, so you, so a lot of it definitely does factor in to the price point that you're at. Obviously if you're less mm-hmm. than say $300, uh, you, you, you're working on a high volume, low margin, you definitely want to make sure that you just get as many bookings through as you humanly can. And then, um, other experiences, you may want to get people to call so um, so you can do upsells or so you can customize the package. So I don't really have a hard and fast rule there, but I would say know your, t- know your market um, in terms of like know what your goal is for your contact form and make sure it aligns with the numbers you're trying to drive. Second thing, make mm-hmm. sure your contact form isn't just a contact form. Um, put the actual details there because with contact form, you just never quite know if anyone's actually ever going to respond, you know, and it oh. could be, the, yeah, it could be the case that you, like I was going to I always say to people, it could be the case that you respond within 10 minutes. No one else does. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have no faith at all. If I put anything into the form that anything will ever come back. <laughs> so, um, so if you do have a form, it's really good to put an indication of how quickly it take, you will respond. Um, that's very smart. Yeah. Um, just to give people the comfort of that being there and also having your other details there as well. Yeah, that's really, really, really helpful. So we've talked about a lot of different things here and you've yeah. indicated that it can kind of go a little bit deep. Um, so I just want to bring up, you helped uh, start a Facebook group that is um, incredibly popular, incredibly um, useful. I'm on it every day. I read it a lot uh, called Tour Operators United. 
Um, can you just talk about that a little bit? You know, what people can find, what, um, why they should be involved with that? Yeah, it's such a miracle that it's grown into something so cool. And we've got, I think, 15 moderators who do so much of the work in helping. Um, Tour Opportunities Net United, it's this, it's this Facebook group that I started for people to basically get advice from each other. It's, we're up to, we've just passed 10,000 members, which is really oh, cool. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> yes. great. I know, it's up to 10,100 or 200 or something like that. And, um, and probably the best thing about it is how heavily we moderate the content. So what people need to understand is every post you see go up, there's two or three that don't. Um, there's so many people trying to come in and self promote and try to sell their tours or get, you know, just basically, um, not thinking the long term about the community, but thinking in the short term about how can I get a win, um, and sell some tours. But we, we always, um, delete those posts and we generally block them as well. Actually for every, every 10 members that, that join to Operators United, one will get um, banned. That's the current system. Oh, wow. There's actually over 1,000 people have been blocked from the group oh, wow. it's because we have a really low tolerance policy. Like it's not even a case of put a bad post up. We'll gently explain it to you. Um, what, what you should have done, right? We just don't even do that because just the volume of spam that comes through is so heavy that we just be like, look, sorry, you didn't come in to add value to the group. You came to take value. Um, and I think it always should be add value first, take value second. And so, so just post deleted, and they're out of the group. Um, it sounds harsh, but that's that's the reason that Tour Operations United is a, such a valuable and active group is because of the behind the scenes work of us being so kind of brutal, I guess, in how picky we are with the content we allow through. Yeah, it definitely shows. I mean, I, I hop on there just to kind of get a feeling of the di different questions that people are asking. And, and I see, you know, people have real life problems and other tour operators that have jumped those hurdles are very, very willing to help and just yeah. contribute to that community, which I think is absolutely invaluable. Yeah, and it's getting better and better too. Uh, I would say when I was four or 5,000 members, there were maybe a few questions a month and maybe a couple of responses. And now there's questions all the time and, and, there, and some questions get, you know, a good five, 10, 15 responses. So I'm really proud of it. Yeah, that's really great. So to wrap things up, you know, if somebody wants to reach out to you, if they have some questions, how can somebody find you? Cool. So my best, um, so if you want to get in touch with uh, Tourism Tiger, the best way to do that is just go to the website and fill in the contact form and someone from Tourism Tiger will get back to you. Um, given that I'm not working full time in that business anymore, that's the best way to do it. Um, in terms of Peak, if you want to get in touch with me, Matthew.Newton um, at peak.com. Great. I'll go ahead and uh, link those in the show notes below. And uh, mm -hmm. Matt, thanks so much. It's been very, very helpful. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Great. Thanks. Cool. Man, right. that was awesome. Yeah, I think that is, that's going to be so useful to so many people. I see so many terrible websites on a regular basis. <laughs> I mean, you, you know of all people. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's and the issue is the persuading as opposed to anything else, right? Like they're yeah. often the last person to to, to see it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I've had yeah, to, that's really great. I've had to make peace with that one. There's just there's just <laughs> <laughs> there's just some people who will not be told, you know. Um, uh, so Tristan Fagan just tries to work with people who who are interested. Actually, one actually one slightly interesting flip thing that happens is like everyone kind of has a crutch. Well, not like, not a crutch, like a hang up around the thing that works. Right. So a lot of, most people it's traffic. I just need more traffic, but some mm -hmm. people I just need a new website. And I've talked to people like, okay, I've got my website. I've done two websites in the last two years. And my business is going nowhere. I'm like, well, it could be the case. It's not your website. Right. And they're like, yeah. and they came to me for a website. I'm like, actually, I don't think you need to worry about your website right now. You've gone through so many versions of it. I don't think it's your website. I think it's either your value proposition or it's your traffic let me look at your analytics and they have mm -hmm. like 162 visitors in the last month. I'm like, well, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It is true that you can't succeed. You can't hope to succeed with your traffic nowadays without a good website, but it's also true. You, you can't hope to succeed without any traffic at all. So. Without any traffic. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs>